there's a way to make an entrance. <laughs> My destiny. It was now a conspiracy of witches. Download Veely today. Coming up. Sharp shooting from a 200 million pixel mega camera. A monster airbag that can catch a car. And jelly beans by the billion. How do they do it? It's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. It's one of the most famous phrases ever uttered. And it's even cooler with pictures. If you're going to go where no human has ever gone before, and if you're going to take some of the most important photographs in history, you're going to want a really good camera. The Apollo 11 mission was shot with one of the most advanced cameras of its day. And the company that made it still build cameras that are out of this world. How do they do it? The first ever photograph was taken by Joseph Nisifor Nieps. It's a view of his estate in France, taken from an upstairs window. And it's almost impossible to make anything out. But this was 1826. Things have come on a bit since then. For a start, most cameras now take digital images. These are made up of thousands of blocks of colour, called pixels, each about 1 20th the width of a human hair. And today, it's possible to turn a photograph of digital pixels into a giant advertising image that stays super sharp when stretched across 10 stories. But that calls for a bit more than a camera phone. Hasselblad in Gothenburg, Sweden, have been making cutting-edge cameras since the 1940s. When founder Victor Hasselblad created the first aerial surveillance camera for the Swedish Air Force. And like their kit, product manager Ove Bengtsson never lies. This camera was the one that Buzz Aldrin and used on his spacesuit to take pictures of Neil Armstrong. So, maybe the most famous camera ever made. Not every camera that was sent into space made it back. In fact, there are still 12 Hasselblad cameras on the surface of the moon. They left them there to make space for the rock samples that they brought back. I've just got this mental image of an alien landing on the moon and being really confused because there's nothing there except these 12 cameras. Buzz's film camera is a bit last century. The company's latest digital model wouldn't look out of place around the neck of Captain Kirk. It takes photos that are 28 times the digital resolution of most point-and-shoot models. Let's put this into perspective. The resolution from a high-end camera phone is 8 million pixels, which sounds like a lot. But the resolution from a Hasselblad camera is over 200 million pixels. This mega, megapixel camera is formed from hundreds of parts. But the secret to its performance is a tiny motor that moves the camera sensor as little as half a pixel between shots. The camera takes six successive shots, then combines them to produce a single image. This means that unlike other cameras, it can capture more than one colour in each pixel. And it produces a level of detail that will blow your mind. The camera motor is built from lightweight, non-corrosive aluminium. Liquid-cooled drills carve out the contours and details of each component with microscopic accuracy. Then the pieces pass to Ulf Leonardson to assemble the complex jigsaw that makes up a motor. With such a microscopic movement, testing Ulf's handiwork is a major challenge which is met with a big pin. Poking something resembling a knitting needle into something so high-tech might look like vandalism, but there's method in Ulf's madness. If the motor inside is ticking over properly, the pin amplifies that movement and the tip twitches. Yeah, it's working fine. As you can see on the knob, it's moving. Next, 
to attach the minuscule motor to the camera's image sensor. This records visual information through millions of tiny pixels. This model uses one of the largest image sensors in the world. It generates over 50 million pixels, more than 25 times the number in an HD television. The camera combines the different colour images it captures to create a stunning 200 million pixel resolution. The price is also sharp enough to make you wince. $40,000! That's nothing compared to the most expensive camera ever sold. A German camera made in 1923 sold 89 years later for $2.8 million. That's a lot. When you're making a camera that costs more than many people earn in a year, it pays to protect it. So Hasselblad turns to metal workers SEPA to create an unbreakable case. They start with 0.8mm thick discs of toughened steel, which they lubricate to reduce friction and feed into an almighty press. This monster punches out the basic camera case with 300 tonnes of force. Then a laser finishes off the fine detail and the camera shell passes to the assembly line. Here, workers add components like the mirror and the shutter curtain. This snaps open when you take a shot, letting light onto the camera's sensor. The word photography comes from the Greek word phos, meaning light, and grapho, meaning to write. In fact, in the 1830s, early photographs were known as sun pictures. With the controls fitted, the camera is ready for its close-up. In the world's weirdest photographic studio. From a cartoon character to a geisha girl, every object in here has been carefully chosen to reveal different technical issues with the camera. And after passing with breathtakingly vivid flying colours, the multi-shot is ready for a bigger assignment. Across town, photographer Arna Edstrom is preparing to photograph one of Sweden's biggest models. The Volvo FH16. She's a beauty. And with the stage set, it's lights, camera, shoot. It's perfect. I think it's a wrap. The 200 million pixel shot is in the bag. And remarkably, you can zoom in 100%, even 200%, and pick out the tiniest detail with no pixelation or degradation. It's an incredible image. But if you want to appreciate how incredible, you'll need to wait for them to invent a better TV. Still to come. Catching mayhem with a monster mega airbag. And sweet as candy, making billions of juicy jelly beans. How do they do it? If you've ever fancied doing this, or this, but you're worried you might end up like this. There is a way. Before airbags, stupid stunts were very, very dangerous. Evil Knievel suffered 400 odd fractures before he traded in his motorbike for a push bike. We can't seem to stop ourselves from trying stupid stunts. Free climbing the tallest buildings. Jumping the Grand Canyon on a motorbike. Tightrope walking between two hot air balloons. Luckily, there's now something that will allow you to try some of these without getting too badly hurt. Making something strong enough and big enough to handle the impact of anything from a grown man to a stripped down car isn't easy. How do they do it? The Netherlands. A land of windmills and windbags. Here in Heerenveen, the big airbag company have been making safety bags for the extreme sports industry for 10 years. 
their giant airbags can be as big as 400 square metres, allowing athletes and thrill-seekers to break in their skills without breaking their necks. The company was set up by a pair of snowboard freestylers. When designer Arjun Geertsmaar started out, making these airbags was a long-winded process. 15 years ago, we had to hand cut all these pieces. Nowadays, we just use a can. There's a lot of parts, over 65 of them. The process starts with Rob Mulder on the computerized cutting machine. He cuts out shapes in toughened PVC. The machine can cut to an accuracy of 0.01 millimeters. And yes, you're right, he's cutting holes because this airbag is not pressurised. Air is always going in and out. If airbags were pressurised, people falling from height would simply bounce off the bag, which would look hilarious, but would not be very safe. To slowly cushion the landing, you've got to vary the pressure. Multiple adjustable windows allow air to be forced out at high speed when a daredevil smashes into the bag. That way, they sink down to safety rather than bouncing off into oblivion. Once the PVC is cut, it's taken to the high-frequency microwave welding room. This is a bit weird, because you think of a microwave as something you use to heat your dinner, whereas welding uses intense heat and showers of sparks. So actually using a microwave to weld stuff together is pretty cool. This machine can fuse together pieces of PVC in under six seconds without a spark in sight. Because we're welding it, it's airtight and it's much stronger. It's even watertight. Welded seams are super strong and they're used on the parts of the airbag that take the hardest hammering. Everything else is done with a needle and thread. Once Benny and Ralph have welded the strips into one airtight piece, it's sent to the sewing room for the extra essentials to be added on. From the straps and rings that hold it in place, to the housing for the twin air pumps which keep the bag inflated. The material is then moved to the assembly platform. There are 65 pieces. It's like a big puzzle. We use a lot of stitches here because uh, the guys who are using it, they do really mad things with it. Big airbags were invented by a guy who worked for NASA called John Skurlock. He came up with the idea when he was trying to make inflatable tennis court covers. He also invented bouncy castles. With the welding and sewing complete, it's then time to inflate the airbag to operational size. To do that, they close all the air windows and fire up the pumps. There are two blowers and it takes approximately five minutes to blow up. And with that, the airbag is ready to be shipped out to crackpots worldwide. You're up, maniacs. The jelly bean. A sweet treat in the shape of a bean. This day-glow delight has been loved by kids and adults for over 150 years. We think of jelly beans with their bright colours and crazy flavours as coming from some kind of Willy Wonka sweet factory. But they've actually been around since the 19th century. In fact, the makers of jelly beans sent them to Union soldiers fighting in the American Civil War. The question is, could they have won without them? They come in a hundred different flavours and every colour of the candy rainbow. How do they do it? Welcome to Candyland. Or Fairfield, California, if you're going to quibble. You don't need to be sweet to work here, but it helps. We eat over 15 billion jelly beans a year, and that's enough to go around the world five and a half times. This factory alone produces over 16,000 tons of jelly beans a year. Flavors range from berry cherry to champagne, and new ones are added all the time. These new flavors are born in the lab, and Jeff Brown has helped deliver his fair share of bouncing baby beans. 
Whenever we come up with an idea, whether it's a lemon or a peach, we will actually sit down as a group and we'll take a look at that. We'll try the real thing and then we'll just start the process of making that identical flavor on a jelly bean. Most flavors are inspired by favorites like marshmallow or strawberry cheesecake. But occasionally, for Halloween or special editions, they produce more wicked sounding flavors. We'll make flavors such as skunk, uh, dirt, vomit, booger. If you can think about something disgusting, we can try to perfect it into a jelly bean. Whether it's skunk, vomit, or something unthinkable like strawberry, each bean begins with a slurry made from cornstarch, corn syrup, sugar, and water. We sure do love sugar. An average American eats 60 kilograms of sugar every year. That's 130 pounds. Richly condensed flavors are blended to form the base mix, which is pumped downstairs to the mogul machine. Invented over a hundred years ago, this massive mechanical multitasker creates thousands of candy molds at a time. Because it's the master of so many jobs, the original manufacturers called it the mogul. To stop the gummy slurry sticking to the molds, they need to be made from a non-stick material. The simple solution is cornstarch, which is poured into wooden frames. The mogul then stamps the shape of a bean into the non-stick powder to create the mold. These mogul machines had a massive impact on how we produce candy, and it was getting cheaper. The first penny candy was the Tootsie Roll, which first appeared in 1896. They still sell over 60 million of them every day, although they cost a little bit more than a penny these days. Each tray contains 1,260 individual molds. As the trays pass towards the sweet center of the factory, a bank of nozzles rises and falls, pumping in the slurry mixed earlier. Each one of these tiny molds contains just the soft center. The shiny outer shell is made further down the line. The filled trays are now stacked and sent to the dry room to cool and cure overnight. Last night's batch goes back into the mogul, which tips them up and sends them off down the line. The trouble is, the jellies could still stick together. So first, they get a steam shower to moisten them. Then it's a majestic leap through a sugar waterfall. The sugar sticks to the moist jelly and acts as a primer coat. This prevents the batch of tiny jelly centers turning into a massive sticky lump. At this stage, they're nothing more than chewy jelly. To build them up, they head to the panning department. It looks like the biggest building site on Earth. But they're not mixing cement. They're mixing a six-year-old's dreams and a dentist's nightmares. As the different centers tumble in these spinning kettle drums, it's time to add some color. And there's nothing subtle about this primary colored palette. Over the course of two hours, flavored syrup and sugar are alternated, slowly building around the center, creating the multi-layered outer shell. And as factory manager Danny Williams explains, the magic is all done by hand and eye. Some people say that when we're panning the beans, it's an art form. I prefer to think of it as it's an experience, it's a feel, it's a candy maker kind of thing. And all of these guys, depending on humidity, conditions, the candy and how the candy reacts, they have to be able to recognize the candy in its different steps to make sure that we're getting the quality that we want. The challenge now is to get that all-important sheen on every bean. So the candy men send them to the finishing room. 200 kilo batches are spun in more giant drums, ready for the secret shiny ingredient, beeswax. 
Amazingly, they shine your beans with the same stuff they use to polish tables. So bees have special glands on their abdomen that turn sugar into wax. It doesn't change the taste, but it makes the candy look great. The beans are then left to rest and firm up, ready for the final leg. Like men, not all beans are created equal. And the losers are wheedled out. First, a robot dumps the beans into massive rotating drums. A specially designed mesh allows only the right size beans to fall through. Then the wanna beans are inspected by eye. Those that don't measure up are rejected and separated out. These sorry has beans are known as belly flops and they're sold separately in the factory store. The lucky winners are sent to the printing press. As they fall into a special tray, they pass under a set of rollers, which prints the jelly bean name on every single one. Each roller can print a staggering 20,700 beans per minute. Each flavour is processed individually, but for those who can't pick a favourite, there's the mixing line. Different batches are laid on a conveyor like a jelly bean rainbow and deposited in this giant mixer. As the beans swirl around, they're mixed into a cocktail of flavours and colours. And at the end of the rainbow is the bagging machine. Empty bags are fed through a system of rollers and 100 grams of jelly beans are deposited in each one. The bags are sealed and sent off down the line. Lying in wait is a trio of frantic robot arms who look like they've had enough sugar already. Once the robo bean pickers have packed them into boxes, they're loaded onto trucks and shipped off, ready to be chewed up around the world. Coming up... Luxury caravans built for the Australian outback. Tuning forks that deliver perfect pitch. Ice resurfaces for smoothing over the cracks. And France's Festival of Lights, the greatest light show on Earth. How do they do it? Caravanning. The joys of holding up traffic, braving bad weather, and doing your business in a bucket. Not anymore. These days, campers tow luxury caravans through the Australian outback, rivers, even the desert. These caravans are supposed to offer Australian men a kind of mix between camping and a weekend in Vegas. But they cost up to $190,000 you could buy a Ferrari for that. If you want to off-road in style, then one company builds extreme caravans with everything from a beer keg to a poker table. They call it the mobile man cave. What happens in the man cave stays in the man cave. How do they do it? <laughs> Melbourne, Australia. Here at Elite, Head honcho Peter Smith and his crew make caravans tough enough to take on the outback. Australia's got some of the harshest environment in the world and some of the roughest roads. The machines Peter builds are designed to be pulled at speed across terrain that would be a no-go for most caravans. In 2014, someone managed to go 227 kilometres per hour in a motorhome. That's 141 miles per hour. That particular vehicle had a sink, stove, double bed, and a toilet. Now that's what I call life in the fast lane. An off-road caravan tough enough for the outback needs a super strong chassis. So they build them from four millimeter thick toughened steel, far thicker than your typical touring caravan. Robots weld the steel skeleton together with pinpoint accuracy. 
Then a team of masked humans finish the job. Every element is designed with the tough terrain in mind, right down to the handbrake cable, which they thread through the frame. Instead of running on the outside, we can have uh, either a stick or a stake. If you're off-roading, it may come up and tear your handbrake cable away. There's actually no chance of that happening because they're all internal. Fully loaded, the trailer will shoulder up to 4.5 tonnes. And it takes 16 hours to make a chassis strong enough to carry all that weight. The first caravan designed for leisure was built in 1885 by a retired British doctor who wanted to tour the country in style. It was pulled by a horse and was fitted with bookshelves and a cabinet for China. Broken China, presumably. With the super steel chassis complete, next they build the frame from wood. Wood might not sound like the toughest choice, but this frame is extremely strong. It's made from a hard-wearing wood called Maranti that comes from the tropical forests of Southeast Asia. The trouble is, Maranti is almost too rigid. The solution is to build the frame using interlocking finger joints that can flex when you're bombing through the outback. PVA glue is used to bond the walls to the frame. Once the completed walls are mounted on the chassis, the next problem is up top. Temperatures in Australia can reach 50 degrees Celsius, which can turn your man cave into a man barbie before your first brewski. The answer? These special insulating rolls of material, which help to control the temperature inside the caravan. Right now, the caravan is just a skeleton. It needs an aluminium skin. This tough, lightweight cladding is resistant to hail, sandstorms, anything Mother Nature or frustrated drivers throw at it. With this, she'll be tough enough to tow through the bush. But that brings its own problems. In the outback, you can go for weeks without seeing another soul. There are no campsites to hook up your power. And if your battery dies, you could be next. Elite solution, the Armageddon pack. It may not look much, but this is the mother of all fuel cells, capable of generating 2.5 kilowatt hours of electricity a day. This thing, you never have to plug it into power, never have to charge it. We've got customers out there that swear by it. Using solar panels and this newly developed bit of tech, you can live off-grid for up to six months. The fuel cell uses methanol, which reacts with oxygen in the air to produce carbon dioxide, water, and most importantly, electricity. Every one of Peter's caravans is bespoke. You want a poker table? You got it. You want a giant TV? You got it. You want weird flashing disco lights? Hey, it's your man cave. The finished caravans come with a warning. When you off-road for days on end to the back of beyond, it's a long way back to the nearest store. Where's the beer? I thought you were bringing it. No they were nowhere. No way, they didn't even show up to play. If this sounds in tune to you, then you need one of these. A tuning fork. The brilliant vibrating tool that's been key to perfect pitch for hundreds of years. Tuning forks can vibrate more than 5,000 times a second, which is about 70 times faster than a hummingbird can beat its wings. Without this mini metal marvel, musical instruments would never hit the right note. How do they do it? Sheffield, the steel capital of the UK, and noteworthy for boasting the only tuning fork maker in the country. 
Here at Rag Tuning Forks, they've produced perfect pitch for the better part of two centuries. Production manager Bob Holmes is in charge of this finely tuned machine. The company's been making tuning forks since the 1840s, and I don't think a lot's changed in the process since then. And I think it's a case that if it's not broke, don't fix it. The point of a tuning fork is to make a sound at one particular note or pitch. This gives musicians a reference point, which they use to tune their instrument. And the search for the right note starts with a length of steel. A tuning fork needs to produce a single clear tone. That's why we use hard metals like steel. Softer metals like gold or tin would barely make a sound. Mick Hudson feeds the steel into a press that was made in the days of Al Johnson and Duke Ellington. This 90-year-old instrument needs a delicate touch, but Mick is a maestro with the foot pedal. With a push of his right peg, a die in the press uses 70 tonnes of pressure per square metre to punch out a steel blank. The blanks are a bit rough, so they're passed to Richard Rawson and his belt sounder. He eases them onto a conveyor that carries them under a rotating belt, which smooths the edges in a process called flatbed linishing. Yep, it's linishing, not finishing. To linish something is to grind it or sand it flat, and once you've linished, you're not quite finished. Next, a stamping machine engraves a frequency designation on one side and the company name on the other. After being heat treated to toughen them up, it's time to jam. On a liquid cooled grinder. Richard here is busy fiddling with the length of each prong. By doing that, he's tweaking the speed at which they'll vibrate, so changing the note they'll produce. They cut to size here because we need to designate frequency. Depending what frequency determines the length of the fork. The shorter the tines of the fork, the less distance they have to move, and the faster they can vibrate, which means that changing the length changes the frequency. The problem is the cut forks aren't smooth. They need a little more linishing. Take it away, Dave Frakovich. A hot session on Dave's linisher, and the forks are smooth, but not smooth enough. So it's time for a solo from the Vibro Polisher. This rotating river of plastic chips smashes against the metal, bumping, grinding and massaging away imperfections until it's smooth as a Coltrane solo. As they jitterbug out of the Vibro Polisher, the forks are looking good. But they're still tone deaf. They need fine tuning from the master. Richard has been honing tuning forks for nearly 50 years. He places each one in a frequency reader. To match the designation stamped onto the handle earlier, these forks need to be 440 hertz, which produces the note A above middle C. 440 hertz means that the prongs of the tuning fork are moving back and forth 440 times every second. And with each vibration, they're slamming into the surrounding air molecules, creating a sound wave. The same thing happens when you pluck a guitar string. If the frequency doesn't match exactly, Richard has a few tricks to adjust it. There's two things you can do with tuning fork. If it's too high, you have to fire them inside. If it's too low, then we shorten them. All tuning forks get higher as they get shorter. The next problem is that rust could ruin the tuned forks and render them useless. The solution is a swim in something nasty. This vat contains potassium nitrate and sodium nitrite heated to 375 degrees Celsius. Liquid lacquer adds a final protective coating, and a dab of paint highlights the frequency. Now they're just the ticket to keep budding virtuosos in tune the world over.
from grand pianists to guitar heroes. Still to come, the coolest machine in ice hockey and the inside story on the world's biggest bulbs. How do they do it? Ice hockey. It's one of the fastest games in the world. They wear all that protective gear for a reason. Those pucks can travel at 100 miles or 160 kilometers an hour, which is easily enough to kill you. But everything would grind to a halt if it wasn't for the ice resurfacer. When the play stops, this cool customer turns the pitted, scarred surface into gleaming, super smooth ice. How do they do it? Ice skating's been a popular pastime for centuries. The world's oldest ice skate is over 5,000 years old. It was found at the bottom of the lake, so I guess it's also evidence of the world's oldest ice skating accident. Almost as soon as the first artificial rink opened in London in 1876, they discovered a problem. It didn't take long for skaters to carve up the surface, and it could take an hour to resurface a rink. And that's where this machine came in. This is the Model A. Frank J. Zamboni's first working ice resurfacer, built in 1949. Frank proudly put his name to the design, and now his son Richard is head of the family business. It's a funny name, a little bit different from anything else, or Smith or Jones or whatnot, but it uh, has really been very nice uh, associated with it. I think it catches people's attention because there's not a lot of it, other things happening at the same time. Today's resurfacer looks as if it's just sweeping the ice, but it's doing a lot more. The machine's cutting edge is a lethal two-metre long blade, sharp enough to slice a bagel. This machine is like a giant wood plane, but instead of just smoothing a few boards, it's got to do the whole rink, and it's got to do it in just a few minutes. Watching a Zamboni is kind of hypnotic. Charlie Brown once said there's three things that people like to stare at. The first is a rippling stream, the second, a fire in a fireplace, and the third, a Zamboni going around and around and around. Just behind the blade, this spinning screw draws the ice shavings into the middle. And a vertical screw carries them to a bin on the top. Each resurfacing shaves off about 1.7 cubic metres of snow. That's enough to make more than 3,600 slushies. But removing the ice is just the first step. Next, it cleans the surface, then sprays it with hot water. This loosens the ice so it forms a nice even layer when it refreezes. Right, I know this sounds completely crazy, but hot water actually freezes faster than cool. Here's a trick you can play on your friends. Take two glasses of water, put them in the freezer. One hot, one cold. Which one freezes first? Incredibly, the hot one freezes faster. And it's a trick that helps the ice resurfacing team when they're working against the clock. Don't ask me why, there's a lot of complicated theories, but no one really knows. Once its journey is complete, the resurfacer heads out to tip the snow down the drain and refill its water tanks. So now we know how it works, it's no surprise that fans are obsessed with what they call the Zamboni. You can't have hockey without the Zamboni, and you can't have intermission definitely without the Zamboni. I'm crazy about it. Anybody that doesn't like a Zamboni, there's something wrong with them. run out of sights to see in France, been up the Eiffel Tower, checked out the chateau. Well, here's a bright idea. Why not visit Lyon? It's a grey day, but all will become clear tonight, when France's second largest city hosts the greatest light show on Earth. Lyon's Festival of Lights is awesome. 
It's right up there with the Rio Carnival and Munich's Oktoberfest as one of the three biggest parties on the planet. Four million visitors, three million bulbs. How do they do it? Not much good came out of the bubonic plague. But Leon's Festival of Lights traces its origins to the dark days when the plague hit Europe in 1643. The plague was a pretty regular occurrence in medieval Europe, but in 1643, the folks of Leon made an offering to the Virgin Mary. Their town was free from the plague for the next 150 years. This festival is their way of saying thank you. That homage continues every December. But the candles have got a bit bigger. At 10am on the banks of the Rhone, and lighting wizard Severine Fontaine is busy preparing her installation of eight giant light bulbs. These light heavyweights will knock out a six-minute synchronised set on a loop as one of the main events of the evening. This is just one of 75 installations that will light up Leon like the 4th of July. Do you know how sometimes when you have to sneeze and you can't and it's really annoying? Well, next time try looking at a bright light. You might have something called the photic sneeze reflex. It could work for you. Up to a third of all people have it. Severine's showpiece is this eight metre high monster. First, the team has to blow it up. In a good way, because the bulbs are inflatable. And despite appearances, these bulbs are energy saving too. Stitched into the fabric of each one are hundreds of tiny Philips LEDs. You would think a show like this would have a huge electricity bill, but no. Because LEDs are so efficient, the whole four-day festival only cost about 4,000 euros, which is about $4,000. While Severin gets ready to hit the on switch, in the road tunnel beneath Perrache Station, Jonathan Richet and David Alexandre Chanel are up against it. They've just a few hours to convert this tunnel into a kind of super-sized cinema. This installation is called Cinematic Journey. It's about like a journey uh, through the history of image and cinema. Cinema was actually invented in France. One of the first movies simply showed a train pulling into the station. The audience was so terrified they ran out screaming, which was my reaction to The Notebook. But this cinema screen is 100 meters long. Lighting it up requires something a bit more sophisticated than the sort of old-fashioned projector familiar to film pioneers, the Lumiere brothers. The solution is not to use one projector, not two or even three, but 16 separate projectors. The projectors are linked together by four media servers. And now, the 64,000 watt question. Will it be all light on the night? Darkness falls across Lyon, and it's showtime. David and Jonathan fire up the projectors, and thousands come to see the tunnel transformed into a kaleidoscopic journey through the history of cinema. While back at the river, Severine's super-sized bulbs light up the Rhone. Across the city, the other installations paint the town red and every other colour of the neon rainbow. And the visitors flock to Leon like moths to a flame. Coming up, making unforgettable music from melted plastic. <laughs> building the cars that are born to crash. And unlocking the mysteries of oriental medicine. How do they do it? There is something magical about the sound of an old vinyl record. Warm, crackly and intimate. No other recording format can match it. 
Back in the day, vinyl was massive. In the late 70s in the USA, they sold 350 million vinyl albums per year. That's 100 million more than all of the album downloads and CDs sold in 2014. When digital music took off in the 80s, vinyl was pushed to the brink of extinction. But like a 90s boy band, it's making a comeback. So when it comes to turning tunes into 12 inches of glorious vinyl, how do they do it? As the birthplace of stars like Lou Reed and Jay-Z, Brooklyn, New York has a proud musical history. So it's a fitting place for Josh Bernatti to create vinyl records for music connoisseurs. Digital recordings take a sound and break it into many, many, many tiny bits of data, which then have to be recombined in order to replay that sound. Vinyl, on the other hand, records a continuous sound. Within the groove are tiny ridges, and when a needle rubs against those ridges, it vibrates, and those vibrations can be amplified into a sound. The first step in the process is for Josh to turn an original recording into a master disc. He starts with what's known as a lacquer, an aluminium disc coated with a layer of celluloid. Josh cuts his master on a lathe built when vinyl was king back in the 70s. They're really, really excellent machines. It's old technology, but don't be fooled into thinking that old means bad. To cut musical gold, Josh uses a jewel. A tiny ruby at the tip of the stylus carves out the lines in the lacquer. Rubies are excellent for precision cutting because they're really hard gemstones. I mean, only diamonds are harder, but natural rubies are rare and expensive. So the ones used for making records are man-made. Once Josh has checked the lathe is cutting OK, he sets the music playing. The ruby-tipped stylus carves an intricate series of bumps and hollows in the disc, which mirrors the sound waves coming out of Josh's mastering console. He cuts two discs, one for the A side of the record and another for the B side. One of the odd things about vinyl records is, the louder the music is, the more space it takes up on the disc. That's because louder sounds make wider grooves. So 10 minutes of pounding heavy metal music may take up the same space as 30 minutes of gentle piano music. So some music is definitely more groovy than others. Literally. With the blade cutting one continuous undulating spiral, it's vital that Josh keeps a close eye on things. If you mess up recording something digitally, you can scrap it, start over, right? Same with video. So not so with lathes. But you can't press records using this disc. You need to make a negative copy first. This negative is called the stamper because it will be used to stamp out the finished LPs. This is where Mastercraft in New Jersey come in. They're one of the few companies left with the machines and skills needed to turn valuable master lacquers into tough nickel stampers. And today, that responsibility falls on the shoulders of Daryl Slater. Daryl will use electroplating to make the nickel stampers. His problem is, the lacquer is a poor conductor of electricity. So he sprays it with a bonding agent, tin chloride, and a thin layer of liquid silver, the best conductor of electricity there is. If he's done a good job, he's ready to make the stampers. If I get something wrong, it's like a domino effect. I could have a spot or a piece of dirt could have got onto the LP after you uh, put the silver on. The silver-coated disc is set spinning and lowered into the electroplating tank. The tank contains a nickel and boric acid solution. When the electricity is turned on, the silver-coated disc becomes negatively charged attracting the positively charged nickel ions out of the solution until the disc is covered in nickel. However, if too much nickel builds up around the rim, it will make it impossible for Daryl to prise the stamper off the master. So halfway through the process, he removes the disc. 
and slips a protective rubber band onto the rim to stop this from happening. After a two-hour soak, Darrell removes the disc and peels the nickel stamper away from the lacquer master. It has ridges rather than grooves on its surface and it's almost ready to press musical gold. Now it's over to another vinyl veteran, Desmond Narain, to apply the finishing touches. Uh, making stampers for 45 years. Desmond has produced stampers for many of the greatest artists of all time. Paul McCartney, Michael Jackson, The Animals, uh, Roger... Uh, we just have one now, Roger... I forget his name. The names just slipped me. And a lot I don't remember now. <laughs> he centres the disc and cuts a hole in the middle. Next, he places it on a second machine and trims off the excess metal round the edge. Once DJ Desmond has finished, the nickel stamper spins back into New York for the final stage in the process, pressing the finished records. That happens here at Brooklyn Phono. The trouble is, the booming popularity of LPs means there's a shortage of vinyl. So nearly all of the new records owner Thomas Burnich presses are made from recycled records. This is your old LP collection's final resting place. Beethoven is going to get recycled. Sammy Davis Jr. is going to get recycled. Is this reggae? Thomas puts the old records into this hatch. Inside, a sealed granulator grinds them down. Next, they're heated to a carefully controlled 137 degrees Celsius. Then the extruder forces the molten vinyl down a tube, ready to be made into records. You can make records of any colour, but there's a reason why most of them are black. Carbon particles are added to the mixture to make the vinyl stronger, and those carbon particles are black. Thomas then places some labels on one end of this machine. At the other, he fixes two stampers in place. One for the A side, the other for the B. After firing it up, the machine slips a hot, sticky blob of vinyl called a puck between two labels and squishes them into place. Next, it slides the puck and labels between the stampers. And as they clamp together, they imprint the vinyl and a slice of musical history is born. Sometimes really weird things are put through the press. Jack White made an album filled with water, and the Flaming Lips released one containing the blood of some of the people who'd sung on their album, including Kesha and Chris Martin. That's just gross. The machine then trims excess vinyl from the edge and spits a disc out from the far end, one every 30 seconds. With the help of companies like this one, annual vinyl sales are growing at more than 50% a year. And that's one record they're definitely happy to add to their collection. Still to come, the world's worst driving school. And the miracle rub in a hexagonal tub. How do they do it? There's nothing quite like a bumper car. The speed, the adrenaline, the opportunity to smash into random strangers without getting arrested. It's a simple joy that's given pleasure to people of every age for nearly a hundred years. But making a bumper car that can survive a lifetime of smashing, crashing, bumping and thumping is no easy task. How do they do it? Reggio Emilia, Northern Italy. 
This is the CNS factory, where they make around 700 bumper cars every year. Master welder Luca Sassi kicks off the process by welding together the machine's main frame. The problem is that it needs to be tough enough to survive being ridden by a 15-year-old with anger issues. The answer is to use hot dip galvanised steel, which has been coated in molten zinc to protect it from corrosion. One of the first major structures to use this technique was the Brooklyn Bridge in New York. 14,500 miles of galvanised wire was used to make the cables that hold the bridge up. That's more than 23,000 kilometres. 150 years later, and it's still there. Once Luca has finished, the body is passed to Giancarlo Bo and Massimo Tirabassi. While Giancarlo gets busy with the wiring, Massimo installs the shock absorbers. These are vital to protecting the car's body and yours on the ride. But not as vital as the bumper itself. It's basically a monster tyre. Once it's levered into place, the inner tube is inflated, creating a barrier that will help you ping around the ride like a human pinball. Tyres are black for the same reason that records are. Natural rubber is brown, but in 1912, manufacturers discovered that adding carbon to rubber made it stronger. While Massimo works on his skills, Ariana Martelli is preparing to brush up on hers. It's her job to create the fibreglass body of the bumper car. Like a lot of great inventions, fibreglass was discovered by accident. Back in 1932, a young scientist working for a glass company was trying to join two blocks of glass together. He accidentally directed a jet of compressed air at a stream of molten glass and ended up with a shower of glass fibres. Ariana begins by applying a wax-based release agent to the inside of the mould. This will allow the fibreglass to slip out of the mould when it's hardened. After being joined by Mirko Ambrosin, they add a greenish gel coating which will provide the fibreglass body with a tough, smooth finish. The fibreglass itself is applied in strips which are fixed in place with resin. The problem the team have is that air bubbles keep getting trapped under the fibreglass. If left, they'd ruin the look of the finished body. The solution? a little roller which carefully irons out all the bubbles. After an hour or so of stripping, sticking and rolling, their work is done. The fibreglass layers are sandwiched in place and left to cure for up to two weeks. Then it's up to Christian Guernieri and Abdel Fakiti to prise the two apart. Most slip off like a glove. Others need a helping hand. All the body now needs is a bit of va va voom. And that's where Stefano Zanni comes in. He applies a slick looking lick of paint with a spray gun. And with the addition of some stylish stickers, the plain shell is transformed into something a young Lewis Hamilton would happily be seen in. The body is then passed back to Giancarlo Bo who adds seats and padded knee protectors to ensure no matter how often you crash one of these, you can always walk away afterwards. In March 2015, a guy called Marcus Gaines, who's a big fan of theme parks, spent over 27 hours riding the bumper cars at a British fairground in an attempt to break the record for the longest ride ever. At the end of it all, he thanked his friends, saying that every time he drifted off, one of them would crash into him, and that's what kept him awake. Next, the body is carried over and fixed into place. Now, it's ready for its motor. This is built on site, one part at a time. Bumper cars use 110 volt DC electric motors that can power the car to over 10 kilometers an hour. They work using a rotor packed with copper coils placed inside a magnetic housing. When current passes through the coils in the motor, it creates a magnetic field. And when the field interacts with the magnetic housing, the rotor begins to spin. As the bumper cars are being driven, current flows from an electrified metal net on the ceiling 
down the pole, through the motor and into the metal floor. You don't get electrocuted in a bumper car because you're not part of the circuit between the ceiling and the floor. The motor, wrapped in a rubber belt, is installed under the front of the body. Now it's essentially a self-propelled wheel. Massimo then hooks up the rear wheels. But the bumper car won't move without one final addition. A wire brush attached to the back axle, which will touch the metal floor on the ride. When Massimo wires it up to the mains, it allows the electricity to complete the circuit and the front wheel starts spinning. With the whole lot hooked up, Roberto flips the machine right side up. Massimo sticks on the steering wheel and the car is complete. Yours for $7,000. Although they reserve the right to bump up the price. Pills. They're the Western world solution to all our ills. And doctors prescribe billions of them every year. But in Asia, things are different. Here, they've been treating everyday aches with traditional herbal remedies for thousands of years. Traditional Chinese medicine teaches that eating ants can help you stay young and that bee stings can cure anything from rheumatism to arthritis. One of the most popular herbal remedies is based on an ancient ointment used by the emperors of China called tiger balm. How do they do it? Singapore, the gateway to Asia, and home of the Hoa Pa Corporation, makers of Tiger Balm. This factory produces around 50 million jars of this potent ointment every year, for sale in a hundred countries. For over a thousand years, traditional Chinese medicine has claimed that any part of a tiger has medicinal properties, even its poo. But, other than its name, Tiger Balm has nothing whatsoever to do with tigers. This ointment is used for aches and pains, itches and allergies. But head honcho Mr Han claims some people have got wind of another possible use. The other thing is that Tiger Balm is excellent for, for flatulence. When you have taken a lot of food and you are, you are, you are full of a lot of uh, gas in your stomach, Tiger Balm relieves it very, very effectively. And this is something which not many consumers know, but those who found out are very happy with it. The balm's recipe was brought from China over 140 years ago by a herbalist from the imperial court named Or Chu Qin. He passed it on to his sons. The ointment was named after the eldest son, the gentle tiger, Or Boon Ho. The manufacturing process begins with measuring out the same herbs that inspired the 19th century pharmacists who invented Bengay and Fix Vapor Rub. Menthol and camphor. It's really clever. Camphor and menthol work to distract the brain. They act on the nerves that carry pain signals and have them send hot and cold signals instead. The boffins here then add clove, kajaput and mint oils to the cooling menthol and pain clean camphor. There's still a lot that we don't understand about pain. But it is known, for example, that women report suffering more pain than men. And bizarrely, redheads need 19% more pain relief than everyone else. Maybe that also explains why they're statistically twice as likely to avoid a visit to the dentist. In a secure processing room, the raw ingredients are carefully blended together in stainless steel tanks and mixed with melted petroleum jelly to make it easy to apply. Petroleum jelly is great for soothing skin. The best known brand is probably Vaseline and its inventor, Robert Cheeseborough, had so much faith in his product that he ate a spoonful every day. Couldn't have done him too much harm since he lived to the age of 96. It may have been a good marketing ploy for Robert Cheeseborough, but this ointment is strictly not for internal consumption. After blending, it's sent for bottling. 
Tiger Balm has been sold in the same hexagonal jars since the 1930s, chosen by Orr Boon Hall to help his product stand out from rivals. Hexagons are one of nature's best shapes. They're found in honeycombs, ice crystals and basalt columns. And they're great because they fit together without leaving any gaps. With the little hexagons inspected and approved, they're filled up at a rate of 80 19-gram jars a minute. That's over half a tonne of ointment every day. But the warm ointment is still too runny, so it's left to cool for 10 minutes. As it cools, the balm turns from clear to opaque. Next, they whiz off along a conveyor belt and pass through this capping machine. The arms of the machine turn in one direction and the jars are spun the opposite way, fastening the lids tightly. From there, it's onto the labelling machine. This machine has been custom designed to neatly apply the labels around the six edges of the hexagonal jars. Finally, they're put in boxes ready for dispatch. The company sells over 140,000 jars of Tiger Balm every day. And if thinking about that gives you a headache, you could always try some ointment for yourself.